Hello friends, my name is Pavneet. I am here on the Unacademy platform to offer you an international relations revision fact course for the preliminary 2021. As the preliminary exam has been delayed, what I have done for you is that I have identified certain areas of international relations which are in the news for the last two years and these important topics which have been in the news for the last two years can be very helpful for you to revise the facts for the preliminary exam. I have segregated the facts into multiple headings and I shall be explaining you about those headings in a few moments from now. I am also an author with McGraw-Hill Education for the International Relations book and the Current Affairs MCQs for Prelims 2021. My upcoming courses on the Unacademy platform include a comprehensive course on international relations starting from July, a comprehensive course on security issues again starting from July, and a Newsweek program which is going to be launched from the month of July which will be a free of cost course for every student on the Unacademy platform. In order to join my IR and security courses, you can also use my discount code called PUBNI10 and get a 10% discount. For any further updates, my link of the Telegram channel has been given in the presentation below. Now, if I happen to explain you the class plan, we will have 5 lectures in the series and the duration of each lecture for this series is only going to be 30 minutes. So I am not going to load you with too much of information that may become very difficult for you to memorize and even analyze. The objective here is to keep the lectures short so that they basically become more helpful for you to revise the facts related to international relations that have been there in the news. My sincere suggestion to you all would be that while I am telling and discussing about a fact, I would expect that you would also sit down at the same time and make notes. I'll try to go slow so that you have the time enough to not only understand what I am speaking, but also at the same time, you also have adequate amount of time to make notes of the same, so that all the facts related to the preliminary exam are consolidated at one place. I have also decided, friends, that this lecture series will be uploaded to on the YouTube channel of Unacademy every Friday and these 30 minute lectures would start from 28th of May 2021. From then onwards, every Friday for the next 4 weeks in the month of June, I shall be uploading the 5 lectures and the lecture plan is as below. In the lecture number 1, that is the lecture today that we will be having, I will be discussing about certain international organizations which are there in the news. In the second lecture, which will come next Friday for you all, I will discuss the second part of international organizations and some international agreements that have been there in the news. In the third lecture, I will explain and we will discuss certain international conventions which have been in the news which can be asked in the prelims and in the lecture number 4, some very minute facts related to the Indian foreign policy will be discussed. In the concluding lecture, that is the lecture number 5, I shall be discussing with you all the international relations summits and certain resolutions of the United Nations which have been in the news which I have identified which could be potentially asked in the prelim exam. So my advice here from now on is that please make sure that you have your pen and paper with you and please make notes of whatever we discuss under each heading. Now when we start with the international organizations in the news it is very important to understand that what I have done for you all is that I have identified those international organizations that have dominated the current affairs in the last two years. While this may not be a very holistic compilation here, but if there would be a need for me to make another additional set of videos for that, I will definitely do so. However, these organizations that we are covering here are at most important organizations and they have been there in the news very prominently. So my sincere suggestion would be to comprehensively cover them 
and make sure that you understand each and every fact that I am about to tell you about these organizations. So let us start with the very first one that is the Financial Action Task Force. My friends, it is very important to remember firstly that the Financial Action Task Force was actually formed in the year of 1989. That means that this is an organization that was also created in the Cold War era. So UPSC can also give you a statement like this. Instead of asking you and testing you on the year itself, they can ask you that FATF was created in the Cold War. If such a statement comes, then it is true. Whereas if the statement is that FATF was created in the post-Cold War era, then please remember my friends, the statement would be false. So please be very careful and don't fall into the traps that the UPSC deliberately tries to lay upon for the students. Second important point about the FATF that you need to remember is that the FATF was created by the G7 group. The G7 group is a group of seven countries. We'll be discussing about G7 in some time from now. So don't worry about it. But please remember that the FATF was created on the recommendation of the G7 group. For what purpose? Very importantly, friends, please remember that the objective of the FATF was basically to combat money laundering. So money laundering is basically a practice adopted mostly by the organizations and corrupt persons to launder their illegal proceeds. In money laundering, the corrupt people normally try to undertake placement, layering and integration. These three steps of laundering the money. However, we don't need to go into those three steps as of now. We'll be covering them in a detailed comprehensive course on security issues. But please remember that when the FATF was created, the objective of FATF was basically to combat money laundering. Now, my friends, I also want you to remember another very important thing. And that thing is that in the year of 2001, the mandate of terrorist financing was also added to the FATF. This is a very crucial thing, friends, because FATF was originally created with the idea of combating money laundering. So please remember again very carefully, if the UPSC says in the examination by a statement that FATF was created to combat money laundering and terrorism financing, then this statement is false. I hope you are able to understand this because the original mandate as I just told you of the FATF was to only combat money laundering whereas the objective of undertaking investigations related to terrorism financing as a mandate was added in the year 2001. This means that terrorism financing as a mandate was not an original objective of the FATF. It was added at a later stage. So please be very careful about this friends. Let us also proceed further now. The Secretariat of the FATF is basically in Paris in France. So it's an organization which is based in France. Tomorrow, if the UPSC says that FATF has its headquarters along with the United Nations, you know that statement is false because the United Nations headquarters is not in Paris in France. So please be careful about this that the FATF headquarters is basically in Paris. Now, there is another point, my friends, I want you to understand. The implementation in the FATF is monitored by a concept of peer review. Peer review means that the members of the FATF themselves undertake monitoring of implementation of the FATF directives. So that means that the FATF directives and their monitoring is not basically done by the United Nations. It's done by the members of the FATF. Again, friends, please be very careful here. UPSC is known to give these kind of traps that, you know, if they give you a statement that FATF was created with the objective of combating money laundering and its implementation of the directives is monitored by United Nations and the members of the UN General Assembly, then such a statement is false. Why? Because I have told you, you have to remember that the implementation is monitored 
by the peer review itself that is by the members of the FATF itself. Now please un remember another important fact that as I just told you some time back that the FATF was formed in 1989. India was not, I repeat, India was not a founding member of the FATF. That means India did not join the FATF in 1989. India joined the FATF as a member on 25th of June 2010. Please remember this because you see the UPSC per se may not ask you the date but I still want you to remember the date in case you are appearing for any other examination beyond UPSC. But friends, again, the UPSC can create a trap for you here by saying that India was a founding member of the FATF. No, that is a wrong statement. India was not a founding member of the FATF. India had joined the FATF on 25th of June 2010. And please remember that India joined as a 34th member of the FATF. So there were 33 members prior to India in the FATF. It was not a founding member of the FATF. Now let's proceed further. Friends, you have to remember one more thing that the FATF has 40 recommendations to prevent money laundering and 9 recommendations to prevent financing to terror groups. Now, as I told you some time back, that the original objective of the FATF was basically to combat money laundering. But later on, in 2001, I told you that they added combating terrorism financing as an objective. Now, what you have to remember here, friends, is that when it comes to combating money laundering, there are 40 recommendations given by the FATF. That means that there are 40 strategies given by the FATF. Through the use of these 40 strategies, the FATF is able to prevent money laundering. Number two, nine strategies are used by the FATF or nine recommendations are used by the FATF for preventing financing to the terrorist group. Now, you also have to remember friends, that FATF is an intergovernmental, informal, non-permanent body. FATF, I repeat, is an informal, intergovernmental and a non-permanent body. Also, FATF has the power to blacklist those countries that have weak anti-money laundering laws and weak terrorism financing laws. Let me explain you this friends, there should be no confusion here. As I just told you, number one, one of the objectives of the FATF is to prevent money laundering. To prevent money laundering, I told you, they have a set of 40 recommendations. Number three, what you have to remember here friends is that FATF basically has the power to blacklist a country. If a country has weak anti-money laundering legislations, that means that once you join the FATF, after joining FATF, you have to create or design anti-money laundering laws in your country. And if those laws that you create or design are weak, then such legislations, if perceived to be weak, they may not be in constraint with the FATF itself. This means that if those legislations are basically weak, and if the FATF believes that those legislations that you have drafted in your country are not adequately helping in implementing those 40 recommendations given, then the FATF could probably blacklist you. Similarly, the blacklisting of a country can also occur if a country has weak terrorism financing laws. Now, friends, please remember that a country which is blacklisted often is negatively highlighted in the world and such a country can also be subject to economic sanctions. So that means that any such kind of blacklisting if it is done is not going to be conducive for a country in the international relation. Why? Because a country which is blacklisted is something which will be perceived as an isolated state because such a country would be not only blacklisted by the FATF but most of the other countries in the world 
would not be engaging economically with a blacklisted country. It is very common sense here that if a country has weak anti-money laundering laws, then it means that such a country is a destination that promotes money laundering. And if a country is blacklisted because of that, then one thing is very clear, that no country in the world would prefer to undertake any kind of commercial diplomacy, economic diplomacy, with such a country which has been probably blacklisted. Similarly, a country which basically is blacklisted because of support to terrorist groups or a country which is basically blacklisted primarily because of weak terrorism prevention, financing prevention laws. Again, such a country will not have any kind of respect in the international system because such a country would again be vulnerable to be blacklisted and to be branded as a terrorism sponsorer state. So please remember that the tagging by the FATF basically is not conducive for the larger international relation of that country. Apart from the blacklist, please remember friends, the FATF also has a concept of grey list. Under the grey list, what happens is that the countries are put under intensive monitoring and they have to basically work with the FATF very closely to develop plans to prevent terrorism financing. So if a country is ever grey listed, in that scenario, that country would be monitored very strictly by the FATF because grey listing is just one shot of the blacklisting. So if you are grey listed, that means you are a country of concern. That means you may have created some laws that may prevent money laundering. You may have created some laws that may prevent terrorism financing. But those laws to prevent money laundering and terrorism financing may not largely be perceived adequate by the FATF. So in that case, the grey listing basically occurs. Now, please remember that FATF also has a dark grey list. The dark grey list is a warning to the countries to undertake action if they are ever put into that category as such. So blacklist, grey list and dark grey list. So please remember these basic terms and the facts that I have told you about the FATF. I hope the concept is very clear to you. Let's proceed. Let's go to the next one called the Asia Pacific Group. Asia Pacific Group is an intergovernmental organization and it was formed in the year of 1995. It was again formed with the larger objective of preventing money laundering but in the Asia Pacific region. So this is basically a group which is very specific to the Asia-Pacific region, which has been created with the larger objective of preventing money laundering in the Asia-Pacific belt. And please remember friends, as a member of Asian community, India is a member of the Asia-Pacific group. And India being a member of the Asia-Pacific group has also taken multiple steps to prevent money laundering and thereby help in achieving the goals of the objectives of the organization as such. Now, let's go to the next one, that is the third one, which is called the G2. So, there are various kind of international G groups. So, we have G2, G4, G5, G6, G11, G12, G7, G20, G77, etc. So, let's have a brief overview about these multiple G groups. The G basically stands in short for a group. Now, the concept of G2 means that it is a concept of two countries and please remember friends that this concept of G2 was basically a proposal made by the US President Barack Obama. Barack Obama had basically advised that a group called G2 should be made and it may be very surprising to you friends that Obama proposed that the two members of the G2 should be US and China. In fact, I want you to know this, that the Obama administration was not very harsh on China as we saw in the case of Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump had basically won an election in the US on the pretext of teaching a lesson to China. So basically a lot of anti-China ranting was a campaign and a poll rhetoric used by Donald Trump. However, his own predecessor, that is Barack Obama at that time, was basically concerned 
in tackling China in a very different way. Obama at that time believed that the best way to tackle China is to accept that China is a global power like US and let China have a complete free hand in the Asia-Pacific belt while the US would continue to exert influence and power in the North America, South America and Europe at large along with Middle East. So basically this G2 concept is something that created a lot of furo. Furo means that it created a lot of hype that you know lot of people not only in the US but international relations scholars all over the world began to say that such a concept is basically detrimental in the long run because China as a country may have risen economically, may have become powerful economically but it is yet to shoulder adequate global responsibilities to be called as a great superpower. So there was a lot of debate about it. However, when Donald Trump became the president, he basically dropped the proposal altogether. But please remember my friend that the G2 as a term gains relevance again because there could be a possibility that Biden administration now might contemplate going back on the Obama administration's policy. However, the Biden administration is yet to unfold his larger blueprint for how to tackle China. But please keep this term in mind for the time being. Now, I want you to go to the next term that is G4. G4 is a very different concept, friends. The G4 basically stands for a group of four countries that include Brazil, India, Germany and Japan. Brazil, India, Germany and Japan conceptualized a group called the G4 with the larger objective of basically supporting each other's candidature at the UN Security Council. You see, India is an aspirant and a claimant for a UN Security Council permanent membership seat. Along with India, we have garnered support from Germany, Japan and Brazil and all these four countries have decided to come together to support each other's candidature. So G4 and G2 have very different objectives. Now, if we go to G5, G5, friends, is an informal forum. This informal forum is a forum for discussion which was conceptualized in the year of 1974. So G5 is a very old forum, an informal forum which was basically formed by India, China, Brazil, Mexico and South Africa. So way back in 1974, India, China, Brazil, Mexico and South Africa created this informal forum for undertaking discussions. The most crucial kind of discussions that used to happen under the umbrella of G5 were related to developmental aspects in the 1970s. Now, let's go to G6. G6 basically constitutes the group of the six richest countries of the world together. The six richest countries in the group of G6 include the US, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy and Japan. So US, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy and Japan together constitute the six richest countries of the world. These countries have come together to create a club of the rich countries where they can have their own discussions. So my friends, if you look at G2, G4, G5 and G6, you have understood one thing that every organization was created or every grouping rather was created with a different objective. If you look at G11, G11 is a term or a concept which was proposed by Donald Trump. In this concept of G11, Donald Trump basically proposed that the G7 countries which are already there should incorporate India, South Korea, Australia and Russia. So addition of India, South Korea, Australia and Russia to the G7 would constitute the G11. This was a proposal made by Donald Trump. India was very elated with the proposal and we remain elated till today because the proposal has not come to implementation as such. I hope these terms are clear. Let's go further. G77 is a coalition of 134 developing states which has been formed at the United Nations for joint negotiation and promotion of economic interests. Friends, 
G77 basically is a group of developing countries. There are 134 members. They have all come together at the UN platform to jointly negotiate and promote each other's economic interests. So G77 is a much larger group, friends. Now, don't confuse the fact that G77 basically has 77 members. It has 134 members. Next is G20. G20 is a name of a summit, which is basically the summit on financial markets and the world economy. So G20 is more about economic diplomacy. It is a summit on financial markets and the world economy. The G20 is also a summit where the governments and the central bank governors come together. So from the Indian side, the central bank is basically the RBI, that is the Reserve Bank of India. So whenever there is a G20 meet, RBI governor is one of the India's representative to the G20. The first ever summit of G20 happened in Berlin in 1999. Now, I want you to understand one very basic fact about the United Nations. We are not discussing the UN system here. But what I want you to remember is that in the year 2019, India inaugurated the Gandhi Solar Park and the Gandhi Peace Garden. I repeat, they inaugurated Gandhi Solar Park and Gandhi Peace Garden at the UN headquarters. Now, why did India inaugurate the Gandhi Solar Park and the Gandhi Peace Garden in 2019? Is because we celebrated the 150th birth anniversary of Gandhi at that time. The garden is a joint initiative of the Indian Consulate General in New York and an NGO called Shanti Foundation and the New York University. The garden, the Gandhi Peace Garden is basically a joint initiative of the Indian Consulate General in the New York an NGO in America called the Shanti Foundation and the New York University. So please remember that. Now, if we look at UN Women, the UN Women is very much in news owing to the COVID-19. Because of the crisis due to the COVID-19, the women and the employment of the women has been drastically impacted. As a result of which, the UN Women has been making some very important observations. Please remember friends that UN Women is a body that stands for gender equality and women empowerment. It stands for, I repeat, gender equality and women empowerment. Its headquarters is in New York and the larger objective of the UN Women is to achieve the sustainable development goal number 5. So please remember this fact. Now. If we look at the UNCTAD or also called UNCTAD, it is basically the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development was set up in the year 1964 and it was set up by the UN General Assembly. Please remember this, that it was set up by the UN General Assembly for the purpose of promotion of trade, finance and development issues. So, objective of the UNCTAD is to promote trade, finance and development issues. Now, the last organization for today's class is the ICAO. ICAO stands for International Civil Aviation Organization. International Civil Aviation Organization is a watchdog of the United Nations for aviation sector. Globally, ICAO comes out with norms that the world aviation sector has to follow. The ICAO has its headquarters at Quebec in Canada. It's very important to remember friends that ICAO has no power to interfere in the internal affairs of a country. This means that the ICAO can basically make regulations, laws, but those regulations and laws can only act as a template for a country. They cannot be forcibly enforced by the ICAO. 
they cannot interfere in the functioning of a country. So I hope these terms are clear to you. We'll meet next week and discuss more terms. Thank you.